And then there were four. Texas Tech's ticket is punt from Minneapolis. Why the Red Raiders feel they can win it all. Over at the University of Houston, the Cougs' dream run ended in Kansas City. The future's bright, but will Kelvin Sampson still be guiding the team? I don't really have a response to it. I don't know what I'm supposed to respond to. With four games left, the Rockets look to finish strong ahead of the playoffs. And has Harden's latest 50-point triple-double sealed the deal for a back-to-back -back MVP? Plus, with the NFL's new interference rule, how will that affect star receivers like the Texans' DeAndre Hopkins? Now, to be run, the bunt pops it up, and the game will end. And the Astros tamed in Tampa, while a 1-3 start is no reason to panic with this club. Hey, it's Sunday night. Let's celebrate. Sports Sunday starts right now. Live from KPRC Channel 2, this is Sports Sunday. Hi, everybody. Welcome to Sports Sunday. Randy, Adam, and Laney in the house tonight. We'll also be joined by Sports Radio 610's Mike Meltzer here in a couple of minutes. Big show tonight, especially with Kelvin Sampson's status still up in the air, guys. This will be ongoing, but only for a brief time, I believe. And we'll obviously have much more on that coming up. Yeah, I'm seeing a lot of pleas from Houstonians for him to stay here. At, after this season, why not? I mean, what a after job he's done the last the four seasons. We'll keep you updated on that. We'll weigh in our opinions as well. We'll have more on Sampson and U of H. But we start with our big story, little college hoops tonight. Team still alive. Final four finally set. Wild finish between top-ranked Duke and Michigan State. Under two minutes to go. Blue Devils up one. Zion Williamson gets in the lane. He had 24 points. Final 40 seconds, though. Duke only up one. Perfectly drawn up by Tom Izzo. Kenny Goins, the go-ahead three. Dukies get two chances to answer. R.J. Barrett misses a three-pointer, then goes to the line. Missed the first free throw, tries to miss the second one, accidentally makes it. So Michigan State runs out the clock, and they stun Duke today. Down goes Duke, 68-67. Lee? Yep, and over in Kansas City, Auburn and Kentucky, a back-and-forth battle that went into overtime. Check it out. Auburn's Jared Harper was the hero, the Knights' leading scorer with 26 points, 10 of those coming in OT. Wildcats couldn't hang. The Tigers get the 77-71 to 71 win in advance to the school's first ever Final Four. The Tigers will get Virginia in the national semis. The Wahoo got a miracle shot to force OT and then won despite 42 points from the Boilermakers' Carson Edwards. The Itascacita grad set a new tourney record with 28 made threes in just four games. He's the first player since Steph Curry to win regional MVP honors despite not winning the spot in the Final Four. And another school making their first ever Final Four appearance, the Texas Tech Raiders. They knocked off top-seeded Gonzaga to get there. Now Gonzaga averaged 90 points a game this season. Tech's defense held them to just 69 in the tournament. They're about the only ones left who hasn't had any real close scares, winning by an average of 15 points throughout their four tournament games. You know, we just stayed the course and kept working at it and working on it. And you now we got to a program where uh, everybody was grinders, especially our head coach, and um, you know who believed in us and was willing to push us and push us to the next level that he knew we had. So, um, you know, that just speaks to this program. You know, we celebrated going to the Final Four. Texas Tech's going to the Final Four. Some of you guys look surprised. Texas Tech's going to the Final Four. All right, so here's how it stands now. Tech UVA will be the first game on Saturday in Minneapolis. Michigan State Auburn begins half an hour after that. U of H's crack at a Final Four. Obviously coming up uh, sh just a little bit short. With more on the Cougs and what's next, let's send it back over to Wex. The Houston Cougars basketball program is clearly in a very good place, fresh off that 33-win season, and that's a big change. Coach Kelvin Sampson just wrapped up his fifth season, but this is what it looked like at home games at Hoffines Pavilion for the Cougars. Then, dark building, empty seats, lifeless, and now that is all changed. Interest in the program growing, excitement in the program all very high, and excellence from the program is there. But the most important change, though, are the expectations to beat, not just compete against the best in the country in the big dance. While the future is bright and the excitement from fans is strong, does the future include Kelvin Sampson? That is the question, the huge question that remains unanswered. The Houston Cougars were quite a story this season. Moving into their new building, the Fertitta Center, carrying the nation's longest home winning streak. 
winning their first 15 games of the season, claiming the first outright conference title since 1992. And after two impressive tourney wins, the Sweet 16 awaited. Then just ahead of the Cougars' biggest game in 35 years, the storyline changed. Now centering around Kelvin Sampson. Is he on his way out the door, headed for Arkansas? The Cougars want Kelvin Sampson. They've made that very clear. A source with knowledge of the situation tells me U of H had an offer on the table to Sampson, six years, 18 million. If Sampson is leaving, it won't be because of money. We certainly want him to stay here. He knows we want him to stay here. I know that we value him. We want him our coach, and we want him our coach for as long as he wants. And his players sound confident. This is where Sampson will be. So he ain't, he ain't not going nowhere. He, he loves us. He loves the University of Houston. I, I feel like he's not going to go nowhere. Yeah. Without Coach Sampson even having to tell us nothing, we, we know his character. We know what he's about. So, I mean, if anything wants to change, he'll let us know. But we, we, we know um, we're, we're not really worried about that. The senior core of Corey Davis, Galen Robinson, and Breon Brady was special. Tremendous leaders. Um, Hard workers. They allowed they allowed me to coach them hard. Galen did a great job of uh, pushing the brand. The University of Houston. Everybody knows who we are now. It's up to the younger guys now. You know, we set the bar. You know, 33 and four, and uh, it's up to them to uphold it. So many people that could come off the bench and score. And um, we're going to be deep again. And um, I think we'll be. Uh, we have the best future right for this team next year. Dejon Giroux, Fabian White, Nate Hinton, among others, ready to keep this program among the nation's best. They have a great returning team coming back and we'll just keep getting good recruits. Coach Sampson is an amazing coach. He'll keep doing a great job with, with this program. We're passing the torch to uh, us. So now we you know we, we, we coming back. We're better than ever. The team that, that's gonna be here next year, you y'all just wait. Their ceiling their ceiling is way higher than ours. So um, I know they're gonna do great things next year and for years to come. Do you hope to see coach leading that charge? Oh yeah he's definitely gonna lead the charge. Clearly with the group that's coming back, they'll be in very good shape regardless of how the Sampson situation plays out. But I will tell you this, the situation with Coach Sampson will not linger for long. A decision will be made very soon. All right, thanks a lot, Wex. We're going to talk more U of H now with the man from Mad Radio, Mike Melter. They're on from 6 a.m. to 10 a.m. on Sports Radio 610. Good to see you, man. Thanks for being in. Randy, absolutely. Hey, let's talk more about U of H, the man behind us, Kelvin Sampson. But first, the season they turned in, obviously, is going down as one of the best ever. Absolutely tremendous. I mean, this is a team that I felt like would make the Sweet 16, obviously, based on seeding, and they got that done. And it was heartbreaking the way they lost to Kentucky on Friday. You know, the heartbreaking shots, the block at the end of the game. But they they just played so well that I can't honestly really yeah. blame U of H for the way that went down Friday. I mean, what a finish. Uh, the seniors led this basketball team, and they keep saying you hear from Galen and Corey Davis Jr., the, the guys coming back are even better. Their ceiling's even higher for this team. Indeed. I mean, this is a team that if they retain their coach, which obviously is the big question, I mean, listen, it's the University of Houston, and it's felt like for 30, 25 years it's been underachieving, but now they finally have everything together in terms of the facilities and the building. Now it's a matter of the whole Samson question. Yeah, Let's talk about Samson now. That's been the uh, the news since they arrived in Kansas City. We reported the U of H had offered a deal six years or six years, eighteen million dollars last Monday before they even left for Kansas City. Arkansas is in the picture. We're hearing that. U of H says we don't want to lose you. Tillman says we're not going to lose you over money. Yep. How do you think this thing's going to go down? I think he's going to leave. That's my gut feeling. It's unfortunate, and I really, really hope that I'm wrong about that, Randy. Yeah. But when Tillman Fertitta starts mentioning specific salary figures, imagine if at your job, you know, your boss started talking like that. I'd be feeling like this is a weird way to put out my business, <laughs> right? And it's making me feel like maybe the Samson side isn't quite as engaged right now of coming back to U of H, unfortunately. Why would he want to leave? Let's talk from that perspective. Okay. He's 63. He's winning big. He would inherit, if he goes to Arkansas, a program that needs to be rebuilt. Yep. That's a big challenge. Meanwhile, here at U of H, he's got it rolling. He's got the facilities, the chance to win the AAC, go to the NCAA tournament immediately every year. Ultimately, Randy, I mean, the bottom line would be if Kelvin Sampson feels like, hey, I can only get to the Final Four or win the national championship at the University of Arkansas, which had all that success in the early to mid-90s, and they can still get to that level, then that's why he would take that job at U of H. Otherwise, I can't see why you would take Arkansas over the University of Houston based on city, mm -hmm. based on 
on facilities, based on new arena. But if he feels like Arkansas just has the higher ceiling, that's the only reason why I would see him taking that job. All right, we will see how it all plays out. Kelvin Sampson, will he stay or will he go? Mike Melcher, Mike, stick around. We're going to talk some Rockets and James Harden coming up in a few minutes. Good stuff, man. Absolutely. Yeah, good stuff. Better than this stuff from the other big story today. The Astros start to the season, leaving a lot to be desired. Wade Miley not terrible in its Houston debut. Three runs in six innings, eight hits the biggest. The two-run bomb he allowed in the third. The offense, very quiet. Except for this Jake Marisnik long ball, his first of the year. That's 410 feet to right center. But the Strohs with just two other hits here in the top of the sixth. That's a strikeout for Springer and a throw him out on Marisnik. Double play ends the threat in the ninth. That's the tying run at the plate. Jose Altuve bunting into the final out of the game. Astros drop three or four and lose it three to one. All right, obviously not the opening weekend most fans had in mind when the new season started, but no reason to panic, folks. 158 games still to go. They're going to be okay. I'm so panicking. I don't know what you're talking about. Are you worried? About. You're I'm a little bit worried? Out. Yeah, no. But there were some bright spots. Marisnik and Alex Bregman had a, had a good home run. I mean, if everybody has their birthdays pretty soon, they'll all hit homers. Bregman <laughs> homered on his birthday. That, yeah. Marisnik got it a day later. Yeah, you know, a little bit of, of in between on the pitching because it doesn't sound so bad, like I said, with Miley going six innings and giving up three runs. But mm -hmm. that's an ERA of 450. If that's his ERA this year, they're in huge trouble. We'll get the uh, first start of the season from Peacock to open the Rangers series and then Cole and Verlander both pitched well, only one of them got a victory. They yeah. got to score some runs. Yeah, I guess Verlander goes again Tuesday, but offense, it's typical beginning of the year. You're going to have guys out of the gates a little slow, just kind of get things rolling. The big boys will take care of business. Even slower out of the gate if you only play one of the first four games, like Correa, who did come back today. Absolutely. Good. At least he's out there again. Well, still to come on Sports Sunday, James Harden with another 50-burger triple-double to get a win and the MVP voters' attention again. Where do things stand between the beard and the Greek freak? Mike Meltzer's back to help us break it down. Plus, coming up, the NFL's new interference call rule has everybody talking. Will it slow down games? That's one question. And will more offensive pass interference calls be the norm all of a sudden? We'll break it down straight ahead. Plus, on the road to the NFL draft, U of H's Ed Oliver sent a strong message to scouts on Thursday. Hear from the surefire first-round pick when Sports Sunday returns in just two minutes. Stick around. Here's what the West looks like entering the final two weeks of the regular season. A Warriors win and a Nuggets loss. That's that one game gap there. The Nuggets could fall back behind the Rockets, but Portland would have to beat them twice to help, which means the Rockets better keep winning. The Rockets still look firm in the top four. All right, so we see just five games left for the Rockets. It also means just five games left for James Harden to stake his claim to a second consecutive MVP award. Sports Radio 610's Mike Melter back with us now with uh, Wex and Laney and myself. Let, let's get to the schedule real quick. Can they hold on and get it done? Number three seed to get the playoff race on, off and running here. I think they can. You look at this schedule, they have some home games against teams that aren't very good, so I feel good about their chances to, at the very, very least, get home court in the first round of the playoffs. And for me, the whole key is just making sure guys get healthy, you, that Mike D'Antoni knows what his rotation is, heading into the postseason in a week and a half. I think with all eight teams having already clinched their playoffs, we're actually going to see some rest days, some load management days for mm -hmm. some players. So I don't know how much these guys are going to be killing themselves down the stretch. All right, let's talk about the MVP. Race. Uh, some people wonder why it's even a conversation. Lady, we start with you. Should it be a conversation right now, or should this be locked up already for James Harden? I think it should definitely be locked up. I don't really understand why it's a conversation either, but I have yeah. seen some talk about, depending on how you define MVP, you know, what James Harden is doing right now is historic, so to me it's a no-brainer. I mean, we're going to be talking about this for years and years and years to come, but what Giannis is doing is definitely impressive, especially with how he impacts that team, and that's the case I think some people are making for him, is that he makes a greater impact on his team, but I absolutely disagree with yeah. the numbers. I mean, it's, it's, I'm trying to understand, I don't. Yeah, I'll tell you what, Mike, that 36.4 number for points per game clearly is enormous, unbelievable, seventh highest, as we're saying there, but it's the gap between himself and everybody else in the league. Right. There's no one within eight points of that. That's historical. That's the kind of stuff that never happens before. And all those other numbers, VORP and box <laughs> plus minus and value over replacement player, they're one and two in almost all of them. This is true. I'm going to disagree 
disagree with you guys respectfully, and I'll tell you why. I'm just going to go with a really simple number, just offense and defense. The Milwaukee Bucks have been the best team in the league so far this season. Granted, in the regular season, that's because of their defense, which is the best defense in the league, and that's because of Giannis. And if you look at the offense, yes, the Rockets are the second best offense in the league this season. Milwaukee's third right now, and you look at Giannis. Here's the thing about him. They're the number one seed Milwaukee is in the East. He can score more points per game. They keep crushing teams, so he doesn't need to score more points. That's the thing. Uh, I, we got about a minute here. When you talk about the Harden's game, the, the offense is getting all the attention naturally, but is the defense that he's played, the improved defense of Harden, getting enough respect? Probably not. His post defense has been superb this season, and the numbers back that down, and also that they backed it up, I should say, and also the steals. I think he's done a pretty solid job defensively. Yeah, this guy could end up leading the league in steals and all those deflections where he's also number one, where he's the best post defender in the league. But the narrative is we're not going to talk about that. That doesn't matter because it's James Harden. It's a bad narrative. And another narrative is this MVP talk back and forth. But I'll tell you one thing these two guys care way more about is winning a championship. Absolutely. And a team I'm pretty afraid of is the Bucks. I'll say that. <laughs> well, if they get to play them in the playoffs, yeah. that'd be pretty that'd sweet. Be, that'd that'd be great. Game. <laughs> Let's take it. Hey, good stuff. Uh, Mike Melter, you can hear him on uh, Radio Sports Radio 610, 6 a.m. to 10 a.m. And uh, you guys are going to have a lot to talk about, I know, starting tomorrow. Good stuff, Indeed man. we will. Look forward to having you back. Thank you, Randy. Appreciate it. All right, now the real highlight at Toyota Center <laughs> last night did not come from James Hart. Nailed it. <laughs> yes, indeed. Courtesy Bill Worrell there. Uh, we put that in there just to liven it up a little bit. Our very own Bill Baez and knocking down the pressure shot at Toyota Center. All for charity on a big night at the Rockets game. Bill's made shot earned his charity $5,000. Sign the guy up. Clutch. That was a, a pressure Bill shot. Gets, by Asa. gets a hug from his son Travis <laughs> right there. Look at that. And speaking of hometown stars, all eyes were on Ed Oliver at U of H's Pro Day Thursday. Reps from all of the NFL teams on hand for the All-American. Oliver, who clocked a 4.73 40-yard dash. His shuttle time also impressed. Head-to-head -head with combine times, it would have actually ranked second among defensive linemen. It was a big day for Oliver. That is sure to kickstart his transition from college to the league. Three years go by so fast, and I feel like it was just yesterday we was at NRG playing Oklahoma, and now I'm doing pro day. So it's like I never took the time to sit down and enjoy the little things. It was always go, 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 go. So looking back on it, I had fun. But right now I'm in the middle of, of I'm not necessarily with U of Asian. I'm not with the NFL team, so it's kind of like, mm -hmm. like I'm an orphan right now. So I just, I'm just <laughs> looking for a home. The NFL draft is less than a month away. Begins April 25th in Nashville. He said he thinks he'll be there. All right. Uh, yeah, his name will be called early. Draft Talk, just one of the many trending topics in the sports world right now. Let's run through it all. Let's quickly start, guys, with, with Ed Oliver. We just heard from him there. How do you guys see his draft prospects a little less than a one month out? I mean, he put on a show the other day in front of the scouts. It'd be hard to believe that people didn't see that coming because of what he did over the yeah. course of the season, the type of athlete he is. But there's almost no way he would drop outside of the top 20, probably ensured he's inside the top 15, and definitely opened the door that a top 10 team could take Ed Oliver. Yeah, the comparisons have just been crazy. I mean, they're, you know, Aaron Donald's size, Arian Foster's 40 time. They've been comparing him with all these athletes of different positions. And he's, he's checking the box on everything. I mean, the guy's a freak. Hey, I love his confidence out there. He, he, yeah. back, he said, you better draft me because if you don't, you're going to make a mistake. Uh, let's stay on the gridiron now. Rule change is coming as it pertains to pass interference in the NFL. It's already going on in the Canadian League. It's now reviewable, both the calls and the no calls. Of course, stemming, this is what caused it at yep. the recent meetings last week from that Rams-Saints game. What do y'all think about the uh, new pass interference? They're going to be keeping an eye on that. I like the fact that um, they're doing this simply because of what we're watching right now. I mean, I thought that that was reason enough to change it. Now I'm interested yep. to see what the parameters will be of this. I don't know if that's come out at all, but I'm hoping it's not reviewable the entire game because it really might slow things down. It's going to involve coaches' challenges. They won't get any extra ones, which might make okay. them reluctant to challenge some early in the game. But all in all, I just have to say, I hate this rule. <laughs> it's ridiculous. Overreaction city. Hello, NFL. You're there. <laughs> now with the new rules, all of a sudden, you're going to see they feel like the offensive pass interference is not has basically been ignored in recent years. All of a sudden, that's going to change. You're going to see a lot more offensive pass interference calls. We're, we're looking at video of DeAndre Hopkins. Uh, he's just one of many receivers, of course, that'll 
could be affected. Well, take we'll a look. Hail Marys out. at the end of the game. You don't yeah. think those are going to get looked at? Of course they are. People push yeah. off on almost every single one of yeah. them just because there's so many bodies I, around. I just don't want to slow down the games even, even more. That's going to be up to the officials to get through the reviews a little bit quicker, I think. So, All right, in baseball, every player has a song they request as their walk-up song. Texas Ranger Elvis Andrews uh, caught everyone off guard with this selection on opening day Thursday in Arlington. Check it out. Let's hear it. Definitely going off the grid, old camp song, never went away from the kids, but Elvis obviously is a fan of that. What do you I did not know that song before this, I'm not going to lie. I guess it's like wanted the, it's to be like memorable. The, the, it's the rage right now, everybody. The kids love it, right? Yeah, I'm it sure, is huge. Yeah, I'm sure all the kids loved it. <laughs> of course, it, caught, it caught everybody's attention inside that, that stadium. So <laughs> We'll see if he sticks with that one. All right, uh, taking a break now? Yeah, we're going to break. We're coming right back. Take a break. <laughs> So Samson Watch this week. Have a feeling we'll have an answer one way or the other. Hopefully yeah, so. I think Samson Watch will be this next couple of days, yeah. very short <laughs> period of time. Silver Boot Series playing the Rangers starting on Monday. All right, we're out of time. We'll do it again next week. See ya.